Uh, this past summer, uh, as my oldest daughter and I uh, traveled to uh, London and Paris, one of the sites that we wanted to see was uh, Notre Dame Cathedral uh, there in, in Paris. Of course, it has its uh, very stunning and sort of powerful architecture in itself, that uh, classical French Gothic style, but equally impressive is that it took nearly 100 years uh, to build uh, Notre Dame, going all the way back uh, to its uh, beginning construction in the 11, 1160s. Well, when we arrived, part of what I was after was more information. I wanted to learn a little bit more about the history, what role this cathedral played in the city uh, and in the nation over time. And uh, when we arrived, uh, there was no, no information like that to be found. There were no pamphlets. There were no books. Rather, outside was sort of a large panoramic uh, display of many photographs, descriptions capturing, capturing the devastating fire that broke out uh, almost five years ago to the day, uh, April 15th, 2019. Perhaps some of you saw uh, the video, uh, pictures of the whole, really, whole edifice going up in flames. Priceless pieces of artwork uh, sought to be rescued from the fire. If you saw the flames, you wondered whether this would be lost altogether. What was extraordinary is that even while it was engulfed with flames, news reports began coming in that donations, large donations, were being pledged uh, from all over the world to preserve or, if necessary, rebuild the cathedral. People were pledging vast amounts of money. Uh, within 10 days, uh, 1 billion U.S. dollars um, had been pledged. And then France itself dug deep, which in some ways may be a little bit surprising given its reputation for being such a staunch secular state and nation. Whatever one thinks of Emmanuel Macron, his words are helpful for us here as we continue in the book of Zechariah. And this is what Macron said. Notre Dame is the epicenter of our life, the kilometer zero of France. It is so many books, so many paintings. It is the cathedral of all the French people, even those who have never set foot in it. Her story is our story, and she is burning. You see, there's a story that cuts through all stories. There is a history that cuts through all of world history, and that is the story of God and his people that he calls to himself and redeems. And in the book of Zechariah, we see central to the story is the great cathedral, we could say, is the temple of the Lord. It had been burned, sacked, destroyed by the Babylonians. And God was calling the prophet Zechariah and Haggai, uh, Zerubbabel, Joshua, these figures in the 6th century B.C. to rebuild. For it's from the temple that God's law and grace and truth flows. And indeed, we know that temple that we're considering points to the great temple, uh, Jesus Christ himself, and to his people, the temple of the Lord. So the passage is Zechariah 6, verses 9 through 15, and this is coming just on the tail end now of the eight visions that made up the first half of the book. Zechariah 6, beginning at verse 9. And the word of the Lord came to me. Take from the exiles Heldai, Tobijah, and Jediah, who have arrived from Babylon, and go the same day to the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. Take from them silver and gold and make a crown, and set it on the head of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and say to him, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, for he shall branch out from his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. It is he who shall build the temple of the Lord, and shall bear royal honor, and shall sit and rule on his throne. And there shall be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. And the crown shall be in the temple of the Lord as a reminder to Helam, which is another name for one of the figures already mentioned, and Tobijah, and Jediah, and Hen, the son of Zephaniah. And those who are far off shall come and help to build the temple of the Lord. And you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And this shall come to pass if you will diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. 
One of the themes that comes through uh, powerfully and clearly in the book of Zechariah is the theme of waiting, waiting upon the Lord. We hear of this throughout the scripture. Psalm 27, wait for the Lord, be strong, be of good courage, wait for the Lord. Isaiah 40, they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. Lamentations 3, the Lord is good to those who wait for him. And our lives can be very much shaped by a whole lot of waiting. Uh, Some of that waiting is just kind of uh, wearing, perhaps, frustrating. The waiting in traffic, the waiting in line, waiting for spring to come. Some waiting is exciting in our lives. The child waiting for their birthday to arrive. Maybe there's some of those here this morning. The student waiting for graduation day. The engaged couple who is waiting, anticipating uh, the wedding day to arrive. But then some waiting, we know, can be very hard and very heavy and weighty. Waiting amidst a painful ailment longing for some cure or help, waiting for grief to subside, waiting for companionship and friendship amidst feelings of loneliness. And some of this is well captured in David's words in Psalm 13 when he cries out, How long, O Lord? How long will you forget me? How long will you hide your face from me? And those in Zechariah's day were a people, it seems to me, who had a lot of heavy waiting to do. As has been noted in Sunday's past, the five critical years to be thinking about are the years 520, when right around that time, Zechariah was called, uh, along with Haggai, another uh, uh, prophet, and when the temple began to be rebuilt to 515, when it was finished. We might think, well, that was the goal, to rebuild the temple of the Lord. Well, important point is that while the temple would be rebuilt and it would be completed, that did not mean the kingdom of our Lord had come in fullness. I'm sure that when construction, I wasn't here at this time, but when construction was being anticipated and began for this sanctuary, 02, completed in 03, that I'm sure there was excitement. I would have been excited, anticipation, the blessing it would be. And indeed, it was a blessing and is a blessing. But as we all know, a completed sanctuary doesn't conclude our earthly trials. It doesn't bring an end to our sin struggles or our inward pains. Think about the visions that have been given to the people of God through the prophet. Visions of peace. Uh, the, The visions had kind of a dreaminess, really, to them. Visions of peace, of God's shining presence, the lampstand, justice, the removal of sin, total victory. So it's understandable, though the temple would be rebuilt, that people in Zechariah's day might be doubtful and questioning When will these things come to pass? And who is able to do the job? And while we're waiting, what are we to do? Where where am I to throw my weight into? Into what? What am I to give myself to? And that is where this passage is very helpful. Let's grasp the larger picture just briefly. Verse 9, the first verse of our text, we're told, The word of the Lord came to me. Zechariah says. I believe the last time we heard those words was at the beginning of the visions in chapter 1, verse 7, where it says, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah. But there's a difference here. At the beginning of the night visions that Zechariah receives from the Lord, uh, the prophet is to see something. But now he's told, as the word of the Lord comes to him, to go and do something. He is to see something in the visions, now he's to do something. And what he's told to do, we might call a sign act. It is an action that he is to carry out that is a sign. It signifies something. It represents something. And that's what we're after. What he's told to go and do is go obtain from certain men who are named, the exiles, some of them who had returned from Babylon, 
Take from them silver and gold and craft a crown. Go then to Joshua, uh, the high priest, a, a figure that we've learned about in times past through this book, a high priest who is called to intercede and represent God's people, intercede for them and offer sacrifice on their behalf, and place the crown on him. And then when you place the crown on him, you then speak a message to him. And that message comes in verse 12. This is all part of the sign act. Say to him, thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, the man whose name is the branch, he shall branch out from his place. He shall build the temple of the Lord. It is he who shall build the temple and shall bear royal honor and shall sit and rule on his throne. And there will be a priest on his throne and the council of peace shall be between them uh, both. Well, we know this is an act and not an actual coronation of Joshua as some kind of king, because we're told in the text that the crown is to eventually end up in the temple itself as a reminder to the exiles and to God's people of God's determination uh, to act for his people. So the act of crowning Joshua is representing the crowning of someone else, referred to here as the branch. Now this language of the branch or image of the branch would have likely been familiar to the covenant community. It was an image directly connected to the coming and promised Messiah as already prophesied nearly a hundred years prior by Jeremiah the prophet. So we read in Jeremiah 33. Generations prior. Jeremiah 33, 14. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and house of Judah, in those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David. Right? David had been promised by the Lord. One will come to reign on his throne forever. Referred to here as a righteous branch. He shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, my people will be saved and they will dwell securely. And this is the name by which it will be called the Lord is our righteousness. So Zechariah's act of crowning Joshua is a sign of another figure coming, this branch who will reign as king. And then we see reference to the language of a priest as well, who will intercede for God's people. Important for us uh, is these two offices of king and priest right, are fulfilled by the Messiah, by the Lord Jesus Christ. And one of the clearest places where we see kind of a fusion of Jesus' kingly office and priestly office is in his ascension. He rises from the dead, ministers, reveals himself, uh, and then he ascends to his father, where he sits now at his right hand. 1 Peter 3.22. Jesus, who has gone into heaven at God's right hand, with angels, authorities, powers, having been subjected to to him. We see the emphasis in his ascension uh, regarding his kingly rule. And then Hebrews, Hebrews uh, chapter 4, a well known passage. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let's hold fast our confession. We don't have a high priest unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And that is what we are called to do today. People need a king. One who will rule their lives well, justly, kindly, and righteously. And people need a priest or intercessor who will deal with their sin. That's the picture, king and priest here. The question I would bring before us this morning is this. What is powerful, if anything, about a sign? What is transforming or impactful about a sign? This is a sign act that Zechariah carries out to Joshua, would have been communicated to the covenant community. What's powerful about this? And here they are waiting for peace, greater peace and justice and victory. What's transforming about a sign. Well, people are interested in pictures and images and signs. I think about this past week, uh, just days before the eclipse, 
the total solar eclipse, I began to learn that more and more people were going to be uh, occupying uh, the Northeast to get a good look at the eclipse. And a few people had asked whether I was going to make the trip, and uh, I said to one person, it would probably take a kind of Fourth of July fireworks, and that not put on by people, but by the natural world, okay, by our Lord to get me to drive all day uh, to see something like that. Uh, but I know some of you made uh, that kind of trip, and Certainly some amazing photos. I've seen some amazing pictures of the eclipse. But listen to these words from an article I read this last week regarding the eclipse. It is the first total solar eclipse to pass over the U.S. since August 2017. The next one to pass over the lower 48 states won't be until 2044. Here's the line. Watching the moon completely cover the sun is a life-changing experience according to eclipse chasers. <laughs> it's, it's hitting me, of course. If you're, <laughs> if you're an eclipse chaser, you're moved by these things. Maybe it is transforming. Life-changing. Moving, maybe. Exciting, breathtaking, but life-changing. I'm not so sure. Well, the sign in Zechariah, to be sure, represents something life-changing. life transforming. Because this sign is representing God's righteous reign as king, his interceding grace as priest. This kind of picture and sign is pointing us to the good news, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. To be sure, what is the gospel? One of my professors at Reform Seminary who himself was first a church planter of a couple churches, minister in the PCA in our denomination, and then became a missions evangelism professor, Steve Childers, for about uh, 22 years. And he required, uh, there was a required class that every uh, first year seminary students had to take, and it was a class that he taught, 22 years. At the beginning of the class, he would always begin with a pop quiz. So gracious of him. And he would say, the question I'm about to ask is probably the most important question you're going to have to think about in your seminary time. Maybe the most important question in all of life. And he said, you don't need to put your name on this paper, but I do want you to turn it in. And then came the question, what is the gospel? What is the gospel? He said 22 years, 22 years, which means he read carefully uh, not only hundreds but thousands of answers to that question. And he said in those 22 years, he really never got a wrong answer. But he said most of the answers were quite incomplete. You can be right and yet less than full or robust in your answer. And the reason for that is because the gospel on the one hand is as simple for a young child to grasp. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Jesus died for my sins. Uh, Paul says to Timothy that the saying is uh, trustworthy and worthy of, uh, con of acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. Of course, that, that is the gospel. That's true. And yet the gospel is so deeply profound, we can never plumb its full depth. Jesus began his ministry in Mark 1, quote, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the times now, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That gospel touches on forgiveness, the removal of a debt, it touches on new life with God, a new position with God. It touches on entrance into a new nature. It touches on the satisfaction of God's wrath. The presence of Jesus by his spirit for strength, particularly in hard times. It touches on a new family, the church. A glorious and new destiny for all eternity. 
The good news touches on all that and much more. And one of the things that disciples are called to do is to be growing in understanding, all of us, understanding and appropriating the truth of this gospel. And it's for this reason. The degree to which one understands the gospel and is able and willing to appropriate it to his or her life is the degree to which one will be transformed and sanctified through their life and the degree to which one's life will glorify and honor the Lord. While those in Zechariah's day were learning what it was to wait upon the Lord right, amidst these glorious promises of peace, justice, restoration, victory, the Lord, through the prophet, is wanting them to understand and believe in light of this picture, this sign act of God's good news. Trust, faith, belief in this gospel sustains, shapes us. The Lord reigns through his servant, the branch, and the Lord intercedes for his people. When the church or the Christian is looking through the lens of culture or of media or of circumstance, it's easy to become increasingly confused or fearful, unsettled. When we see through the lens of what God says we behold good news. We have something firm to hold on to. Someone we find holding on to us. And then there's more good news in this text. We're told that this branch, this royal servant, verse 12, shall build the temple of the Lord. How wonderfully this foreshadows Jesus' own promise in Matthew 16. There in Matthew 16... Recall Peter confesses Jesus as the Christ. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus says, blessed are you, Peter. And he goes on and says, and I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. John Calvin comments on those words, I tell you, you are Peter, to confirm to Peter that the name Jesus gave to him, Petra, rock, Peter, was not given in vain. I tell you, you are Peter. That though he and the small band of disciples were few, seemingly insignificant in time, they, as the temple of God in Christ, would spread out in a powerful way. That's kind of the picture we have going on in Zechariah. And here we see our own call from the Lord to be about his... Uh, great work. Verse 15, those who are far off shall come and help to build the temple of the Lord, and you shall know the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. You know, we've probably all experienced as a parent or a child, or maybe in both cases, where there's some project that needs to be done, maybe around the house. The roof needs repairing, building a shed, working on a car, and, and the parent, and I'm going to say I'm guilty of this, the parent, the one who knows how to do the job, does all the job. And the, the child just simply kind of looks on. Maybe, maybe at best handing the parent a tool here or there. But some of you, some of you are great teachers. I've seen. Where teaching the child the skill becomes almost as important as the project itself. Well, our Lord is the master teacher. He is the master teacher. And by his grace, amidst all of life's demands, labor, sometimes busyness, he's calling us to be about his great project of building up his kingdom and building up his church. You know, there are many positions and many places to serve in the life of a church. We think of our own church. We have officers, music and worship, Sunday school, nursery, discipleship groups, prayer gatherings, Bible studies, women's ministry. You could go on. But I just want to leave us with this. The most important ministry we have is to live as a Christian, wherever we are, whatever we are doing. To live as a Christian, to live with the Christ-like characteristics that we see through the scriptures, with that humble heart, with a, a zeal for the truth of the gospel, with desire to serve, right? 
to live as a Christian wherever we are, whatever it is that we are doing. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your precious word. Lord, we continue to draw near to you and your word by your spirit, and we pray that you would work it in our hearts. Grow, Lord, most of all, grow our heart's desire for you, for your precious word. We pray that you would sanctify us, Lord, and continue to to go before us. We would know your presence. Lord, these promises of peace and justice and and victory, these, these are promises for us, for your people. And yet we pray, Lord, that you would strengthen and grow our faith and our rest in the good news of the gospel, that it be the foundation upon which we live and stand, the message that we value most and that we are most eager to make known. Grow us in our understanding of it and of our appropriation, application of it to all of life. Lord, minister to us by your spirit and grace, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.